Well, rest assured, we will look not only at the beginning of Psalm 73, but at the end. When the uh, readers came in this morning for our pre-chapel prayer time, I referred to them as our grumpy readers with all their complaints this morning so dramatically presented. I want to begin this morning by imagining a climber clinging to a sheer face of rock thousands of feet above ground. This is a free solo. No ropes, no cleats or crampons, no safety harnesses. A slip and fall means certain death. And then imagine our mountaineer feeling a foothold give way or scrambling for a handhold and missing entirely. Imagine the sudden fear of falling and then the amazing relief of holding on and still having a chance to make it to the top. Yes, sir. This was Asaph's experience with faith and doubt. The psalmist had been making progress on his free solo through life and like a climber near the summit, clinging faithfully to the God of Israel when suddenly he felt his foothold start to give way. And later when he put his experience into writing, he said, as for me, my foot had almost slipped. Yes, in that desperate moment, Asaph nearly gave up the faith, let go of God, fell to his spiritual death. It was a really close call. Anyone who has ever struggled with doubt knows how easy it is to lose your spiritual grip. But at the last moment, something happened to Asaph that saved him. Thank God there was a, a move he made when he was in danger of falling that strengthened his hold and rescued his soul. Yes, sir. I think hearing his testimony can help us get a grip too especially when we have doubts about God's fundamental fairness. Let me tell you a little bit about Asaph. He may be after King David, the Bible's most famous singer-songwriter. You might think of him as a worship leader who became a recording artist. Psalm 73, one of only a dozen worship song, songs that the Psalter attributes to Asaph. And this particular song begins the way you might expect a worship song to begin. It's, it's a strong note of praise. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. No hint of doubt in the opening lines. Here, Asaph expresses the praise of a grateful nation and highlights the importance of personal faith. It's the pure in heart that see God, and it's his own testimony. He believes in the goodness of God. And yet, as the song continues, we discover that this man Asaph has struggled with serious doubts about the very truth claims that he makes when he sings. And what we heard in verses 2 through 14 is his crisis of faith. Is God indeed good to his people? There was a time when Asaph was not sure. Sure, many pe people believe in the goodness of God. But as for me, he said, my, my feet had almost stumbled. My step, steps had nearly slipped. You'll notice that he is speaking in the past tense. Verse 1 is present perspective, a faith-filled conclusion. But... What follows gives us a flashback to a season of spiritual doubt that almost became the singer's downfall. The rest of the psalm, Asaph tells us why he almost fell away and also what God did to strengthen his grip. Yes. And what he couldn't understand was why good things happened to bad people. It made him really jealous. I was envious of the arrogant, he says in verse 3, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, I mean, it just isn't fair. If God is good, then obviously he will do good to those who are good, and he will punish wrongdoers. And yet, as Asaph looked at what was happening around him in the world, he saw, as we often see, exactly the opposite. 
The righteous were struggling. Evildoers were getting away with murder, sometimes literally. As far as Asaph could see, the ungodly were free from earthly cares. They were in peak physical condition. They, they got their way at the expense of others. They, they are arrogant and violent. Everything that God hates, that's what they're all about. Nothing is sacred to them. They even mock the Almighty and go unscathed. And the more evil they perform, the more popular they become. Oh, this, this irritated Asaph to no end. And we witness the same phenomenon, I believe, in today's celebrity culture. So many things, contrary to scripture, are celebrated as morally superior, and that very popularity of unrighteousness leads people astray. In fact, we notice in verse 10 that people in Asaph's community, rather than turning back to God, were turning towards wrongdoing. They were giving their likes and their follows to ungodliness. And they thought God didn't notice. How can God know? They scoffed. What I do in my own privacy, is there really knowledge in the Most High? I mean, it is, it is quite a list that Asaph goes through. And we get the sense that he is not only envious of others, but also embittered against God. He says in verse 12, it's a kind of summary. These are the, the wicked. They are always at ease. They increase in riches. Take a look. He's saying the ungodly are healthy, wealthy, and famous. And it all seemed so unfair. The righteous ought to be rewarded and the wicked surely punished. And, and yet for Asaph, this really wasn't a justice issue. His concern was much more selfish because seeing the wicked prosper made him doubt whether it was worth all the sacrifices he was making to serve the living God. It's all in vain that I've kept my heart clean. He said, and wash my hands in innocence, because what's happening to me all day long, I'm stricken and rebuked. Walking with God was a struggle for Asaph, as it, as it is for most believers. And when he saw how wealthy the ungodly were and how trouble-free their lives seemed to be, he doubted whether it was worth it. Is it worth it to keep myself pure, he wondered. He had what today we might diagnose as a kind of spiritual FOMO. He felt shortchanged. Here he was investing his life in the service of God, and he wasn't getting much out of it. Yes, sir. He seemed undercompensated. And so he was ready to walk away from God. If the ungodly were happier anyway, it all seemed like a huge waste of time. Have you felt that temptation? Have you felt it at Wheaton? Will you feel it after Wheaton? Surely one day you will. It will seem easier to make money than to give it away for kingdom purpose. It will seem more enjoyable to sleep in on Sunday than to get up and go to church. It will seem to feel better to give in to sexual sin than to pursue purity. Yes. In one way or another, it will seem more beneficial to turn away from God than to follow him. And you will feel your foot starting to slip. Yeah. Now, before I show you what changed Asaph's mind, I wanna point out that his premise is debatable. Is it really true that atheists, for example, and agnostics lead happier lives? Actually, there is ample research to show that in many ways life is better for people who follow after God. Yes. Not long ago, I read a summary of some of this research. The article had a provocative title, No, Christianity is not as bad as you think. And it documents how Christians experience less depression, less suicide, less addiction, less abuse. The point isn't that we don't struggle with those things because we do. 
but comparatively so, less so. And at the same time, Christians give more generously, receive more social support, enjoy more satisfaction, have more opportunities to do meaningful things with their lives. Don't just give in to Asaph's way of thinking and assume and uh, grant his premise in the beginning of this psalm. It may be flawed in the first place. And yet, sometimes we are tempted to see the world the way Asaph did and think that the sinners have much more fun. Do you know what changed Asaph's perspective entirely? Well, we didn't read these verses, but you sense that his perspective is shifting in verse 15, where he says this, if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. And suddenly you realize everything in verses two through 14 All these things that readers were saying all through Edmund Chapel this morning, those were hypotheticals. Those were things that Asaph was starting to think, but then held himself back until he had time to really think things through. Just want to point out an important caution for us here. Asaph realized that his doubts could have a negative spiritual influence on others. If he denied the goodness of God, as he was tempted to do, it would have been a betrayal of God in one sense. But he says in verse 15, it also would have betrayed the people in his faith community, people he loved and served. He didn't want to drag them down with his skeptical doubts until he really had an opportunity to think them through. Now, we should be honest about our spiritual struggles. And I think especially so when we can process them with mature believers who have had their own doubts and can help us reason our way back to God. That's one of the reasons we have the wonderful faculty and staff we have on this campus. But it's still good to remember, you're not the only person affected by your doubts. Especially be careful of newer, younger Christians with the negative thoughts you're still thinking through. I'm I'm not telling you to pretend, but I am encouraging you to doubt your doubts and fight against your unbelief, not only for the sake of your own soul, but for the sake of others around you. When Asaph had his doubts, he was honest about them. In fact, eventually he put them into into a song that everybody in Israel would sing, but he was careful not to drag people down with him. Instead, he did the one thing that could and did make the biggest difference in his relationship with God. You know what that is? He went to worship anyway. That's what he did. Before he lost his spiritual grip, before he reached any wrong conclusions about the fairness of God, he went back to God's temple. Listen to how he describes that faith-strengthening, doubt-challenging, foothold-stabilizing moment. But when I, I thought how to understand this, had seemed to me a wearisome task. He was worn out spiritually of all the struggle until, he says, I went into the sanctuary of God. And his experience in God's holy presence, and we've been singing so beautifully about the holiness of God, the only holy God, and what a difference that makes this morning. When he came into God's presence, he had a massive paradigm shift that made him want to take back all the bitter things that he had been thinking about God and tempted to say out loud. He worshiped God even when he didn't really feel like worshiping God, which interestingly, apparently, is something that happens to worship leaders too. And Asaph acknowledges it. And that worship experience strengthened his spiritual grip. Something similar happened to the contemporary poet Christian Wyman, who writes about his experience in a very widely read, influential essay, Love Bade Me Welcome. Wyman had been diagnosed with a rare and incurable form of blood cancer on his 39th birthday of all days. At the time he had been married for less than a year, he and his wife, understandably, were devastated. They were not They were not, God followers would not have described themselves as such. Then one morning, Wyman writes, we we found ourselves 
going to church, found ourselves. That's exactly what it felt like in both senses of the phrase, as if some impulse in each of us had finally been catalyzed into action so that we were casting aside the Sunday paper, moving toward the door with barely a word between us, and as if once inside the church we were discovering exactly where and who we were meant to be. That first service was excruciating in, in, in that it seemed to tear all wounds wide open and profoundly comforting in, in that it seemed to offer the only possible balm. Now, in one sense, there was nothing extraordinary about what either Asaph or the Wymans experienced. All they did was walk into an ordinary worship service, and yet what happened there was profound because they entered into the presence of the living God. Yes, sir. I think one of the best ways to understand the difference that worship makes is to follow the pronouns in Psalm 73. If you take some time with this psalm later today or tomorrow morning, you'll see what I mean, I think. It begins with a God-centered focus. Surely God is good. But then in verse 2, Asaph decides to take what you might call a spiritual selfie. But as for me, is it really surprising that when he turns the lens back on himself that he starts to struggle? And then verses 3 through 14, all the pronouns are they and them. He's not taking responsibility for his life before God. He's comparing himself to others, which doesn't help him in his relationship with God at all. It's only when he turns from me and they to thee and thou that he gains proper perspective. I'm not saying, it's important to listen to me this morning, what I'm not saying as well as what I am saying, I'm not saying that coming to chapel or going to church solves all our problems or resolves all our doubts. We bring our spiritual struggles with us into worship. And sometimes, haven't you had this experience? Sometimes, actually, being in the presence of God, being with other believers, it actually makes those struggles more painful. It makes them harder, it seems to. I, I get that. But I also know that Jesus promised to be present by his Holy Spirit when we worship, even when just two or three of us gather in his name, he's right there with us. The Bible says that when we come to worship, we are not alone. We join myriads of angels and the saints who have gone before us and Jesus himself at the throne of Almighty God. That's the promise of Hebrews. And so there is no better place for us to have a fresh encounter with our Savior than where he has promised to meet us in public worship grounded in the gospel, and that's where we acknowledge God for who he is. We stop speculating about God and start encountering him. And we remember that he is God and we are not. And we don't even think about our experience of God. Even that can, in a way, get in the way. We only think about God himself. It's in worship. The focus gets shifted off of ourselves, and we find a secure foothold for our faith in the triune God. I want to tell you something specific. This is really the last thing, something specific that turned his doubt into faith. He's there in worship, and he notices something. He sees something. Do you know what that is? He sees how the story ends. In the moment, all he could see is how much healthier and wealthier he would be if he turned away from God. But when he stepped into God's sanctuary, he tells us, I discerned their end. By which he means that because of the justice of God, which has also been one of the themes of our song this morning, one day the wicked would be condemned. And he goes on in the following verses to describe what's going to happen to the ungodly. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. They're the ones that are gonna be in the free fall. And near the end of the Psalm, Asaph says, behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone unfaithful to you. He understood that the wicked would fall under the justice of God, 
that in the final judgment, the fairness of God would be revealed. And at the same time, he also saw that the righteous would receive a merciful reward. The sins they confessed would be forgiven. The sacrifices they made would be redeemed. The service they offered would be remembered. And best of all, we would have God's loving presence in our lives from here to eternity. Let me give you these beautiful verses, Psalm 73, verses 23 and 24. These are good words to pack with you on your spiritual climb. I am continually with you, Asaph says. You, you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. When Asaph understood all of that, he confessed his sins. He, he realized how wrong he had been about the unrighteous, how bad his attitude had been about God. When my soul was embittered, he confessed to God, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. It's a reminder that bitter doubts are nothing to be proud of. They're actually sins to repent of, the bitter ones. What Asaph saw also led him to confess his faith. What he saw in worship strengthened his grip so much that he wanted to end the worship service with a personal testimony. I wonder if you're able to make these words your own. Maybe you've heard them before from the end of Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. And here Asaph returns to the pronouns I and my, but not in a self-centered way because he's in the presence of God. So there's a you in these verses as well, his loving and faithful God. He sees himself the right way in relationship to God. And he is standing when he sees this. He is not slipping. His field of vision is filled with what he has, not with all the things that he thinks other people have. And what he has is actually the only thing he needs or deep down really wants or could ever want or ever truly need, and that is the living God. Yes, sir. I love the understatement of verse 28. For me, it's good to be near God. That's what Asaph says. If God is good, which is where this psalm started, then what is good for us is to be where God is. And this is God's promise to us in Jesus Christ. The Savior who was born in the manger, who was crucified at Calvary, who rose from the grave on the third day and ascended into heaven, his promise is to be with us every step of the way. Amen. It's a good promise for us to hold on to the first day of spring semester, every day for the rest of the semester, and every day until the day when Jesus receives us into his glory. Let's pray. Lord, bless us in this new semester. We feel so many of us excited about the new prospects and possibilities. We also know we bring with us so many of our same old struggles. We need your forgiveness. We need your mercy. We need your hope. We need a clear sense of who you are. We need your nearness. Lord, help us to rest in the good place of your presence. Now, today, this semester, and forever, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You are dismissed.